It's eight o'clock. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ravi Sivalingam. I'm with Qualcomm AI Research, and I'm glad to be moderating our next installment of FannyML Talks. Build an edge optimized FannyML application for the Arduino Nano 33 BLE Sense by Chris Narowski from the Sensible Corporation. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you're joining us from. We'd like to thank our TinyML Talk sponsors, ARM and Qualcomm, who are our TinyML strategic partners, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Maxim Integrated, Kikso, Reality AI, and Syncense. Additional sponsorships are available. Please contact Olga at tinyml.org for more info. I'd like to remind everyone about the TinyML Vision Challenge, which is open now. It's created in by the TinyML Foundation in collaboration with Hackster.io. Uh, it's a challenge with a focus on developing new use cases and apps for TinyML Vision and promoting TinyML tech and companies in the developer community. Submissions are accepted until August 15th of this year, and the winners will be announced on September 1st with a total price money of $6,000. Sponsor sponsorships are available for this competition as well. Please reach out to sponsorships at tinyml.org. You can find more information about the competition at hackster.io slash contest slash tinyamalvision. Just a quick recap of our successful TinyML Summit 2021. We had five days of tutorials, talks, panels, breakouts, and symposium. Uh, we had over 5,000 registered attendees over, from over 100 countries, over 1,000 companies, and over 400 academic institutions represented. We had 26 sponsoring companies. All the videos are available on youtube.com slash tinyml. And uh, as a reminder, our next tinyml summit 2022 will be happening in January, a little earlier in the year, January 24 to 26 in Silicon Valley, California. Another upcoming major event is our tinyml summit EMEA. Uh, it's happening June 7th to 10, 2021. It's fully virtual, but live. The deadline for abstracts is already passed. It's, it's on May 1st. Uh, sponsorships are being accepted. It's sponsorships at tinyml.org. Please visit tinyml.org for more information about this event. Our next tinyml talk is by Karthik Thakur, co-founder HOTG on building tinyml applications using Rune. It's on Tuesday, May 25th, two weeks from now, same time. Please contact talks at tinyml.org if you're interesting, interested in presenting an upcoming uh, event. All right, our speaker today, Chris Norowski, is the co-founder and CTO of Sensimal, where he builds tools at, to make it easier for developers and engineers to create smart sensor algorithms capable of running at the extreme edge. Prior to Sensimal, he worked as a software engineer and data scientist at Intel and DuPont Pioneer. He holds a PhD in computational physics from Iowa State and a BS in physics from Virginia Tech. All right, take it away, Chris. Thanks, Ravi. And thanks Tiny, to the TinyML organizers um, and all of you for attending this talk. My name is Chris Narowski and I'm the CTO at Sensimal. Today, I'm gonna talk to you about some of our experiences and lessons learned building TinyML applications. I'm also gonna walk through how we use the Sensimal toolkit to build an application to recognize boxing gestures that runs entirely on the Nano 33 BLA sense. It makes use of the onboard IMU, uh, the accelerometer and gyroscope sensors. For those of you not, that aren't familiar with Sensimal, uh, our goal is to empower developers to rapidly add AI to their own edge devices, um, to allow their applications to autonom autonomously transform raw sensor data into meaningful insights. We've taken years of the lessons learned in creating products that rely on edge optimized machine learning and distilled that knowledge into a single framework, which is the Sensimal Analytics Toolkit uh, that provides an end-to-end -end development platform spanning data collection, labeling, algorithm development, firmware generation, and validation and testing. So for every new customer application or POC, I always go through a checklist to validate if the problem warrants the additional uh, complexity, logistical complexity, such as remote model and firmware updates, resource constraints, 
Um, and if I can qualify that a customer does need TinyML, then I know they're much more likely to complete the project. We're switching to a more traditional approach for streaming sensor data back to the cloud for analysis. Um, so kind of the things that I go through is first, I wanna make sure the problem's tractable in general. Uh, given the full resources of the cloud, are they able to solve this problem? Uh, so if they're not able to do that, using TinyML is not gonna help either. Um, so on the other side of that is I wanna make sure that the problem is suitably complex, that it needs machine learning. So if a simple threshold detection is gonna work, um, there's a simple threshold to detect like excessive vibrations will work. There's no need for an entire machine learning pipeline. Um, so typically I know a problem is suitably complex to use machine learning if it makes the problem uh, scalable, meaning that the solution could use a hand code heuristics to solve the problem, but it's not gonna be general enough or it's gonna be too brittle. So keyword spotting is a great example of a problem where machine learning makes the solution scalable. Uh, if you, you could make a hand-coded solution for maybe a single word or a single speaker, um, but by using machine learning, it allows, allows us to solve that problem for many speakers, words, and different accents. So once those criteria have been cre cleared, the next thing I looked for is um, look for something that makes the TinyML the right solution versus streaming data back to the cloud. Uh, and so one of those sticking points can be security and privacy. So if the data needs to remain on the device, and they need to make a decision there, then TinyML is definitely the right choice. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that within the community with respect to audio and visual data. Uh, oops. Another thing is latency. So how quickly um, do the responses need to happen? If you're detecting a drill bit's about to break due to excessive stress or vibration, then you need to know immediately and the added latency could be too much. The drill bit could already be broken. Connectivity is another huge one. The sensor data for applications deployed in remote locations or in its networks can easily exceed the available bandwidth. If you're on 5G, a 5G battery powered device, you can't necessarily afford to stream uh, full fidelity audio or vibration data. Instead, you need to analyze that data locally and only report out metadata when necessary. Power goes along with connectivity. Uh, a lot of times you wanna be able to extend the battery life to months or years. Um, so that you can deploy sensors in all sorts of different locations for all sorts of different applications. And finally, the epic economic. Um, does it make economic sense? TinyML applications, um, typically the cost of the hardware and the power budget are just as important as the model's accuracy. And we often find ourselves using a model that, that maybe has lower accuracy, but fits within the power budget of our device. So here's a list of applications where TinyML makes sense right now, um, such as determining when a machine might be starting to wear down, automating the smart home, monitoring roads for ice buildup, uh, reducing energy expenses with activity and presence detection, uh, helping the elderly live at home longer, helping injured recover more quickly, or helping athletes reach peak performance. Um, and we've even seen some applications of monitoring health of animals on a farm uh, and, dis and dispersed out. So new applications are emerging every day and there's a lot of room for innovation and experimentation in this space. So that's kind of what I go through when I think about, is this a potential for TinyML? Um, is it gonna make sense here? And next I wanna talk about the process of actually building an application. Uh, so the first step is to define the application and understand ex economics. It's important to understand not just if the application is possible, but if it's gonna be possible within your cost. For example, if you're thinking about building a smart, smart golf club set and you envision a solution that needs sensors on every club, it's probably not going to make um, economic sense or be great for the user if they have to charge their clubs all the time, all their clubs all the time. Uh, so the next thing you want to do is assemble a prototype. The big decisions here are around which sensors do you think you need? Do I need accelerometer, gyroscope, audio? And then also, how am I going to get the data off the device? If it's a wearable, you may want to add a wireless connection. Uh, but depending on the sample rate, you may need to collect data um, over Wi-Fi or BLE, or it might need to store data to an internal SD card. And you may also need to hook up a battery versus powering it over USB. In parallel with designing the prototype, it's a good idea to spend some time thinking about the data collection methodology. One of the number one questions we get is how much data do I need? So making an educated guess about how many subjects or machines you need to collect data exempts 
to capture the variance of your data set is often dif difficult to predict ahead of time. So by defining uh, the metadata that you want to capture early on, it's going to help you better identify where that variance is coming from later down the line. And this will help you figure out which additional data types of data you need to collect as you start iterating on this model building process. You'll also need to identify any domain expertise that you need to help when you're labeling. So if you're building a running wearable, having a running coach can be an invaluable tool to help label um, improper running strides or whatever types of uh, running that you need to detect. And now that you've set that up, it's time to actually start collecting data uh, and annotating your data set. So here you may need to arrange for subjects to come into a facility or go to a factory to start adding sensors to devi sensor devices to machines. Um, you need to make sure to capture enough metadata that you or a domain expert can accurately label the ground truth afterwards. Uh, so without good tools to manage this, labeling data can be a huge challenge, especially if you're dealing with uh, sensor data um, versus uh, like sensors like vibration data or temperature data, unlike audio or video, it can be nearly impossible to look at and label it. Uh, finally, it's time to build your model and validate it working on held out data set. And once you're happy with the results, you'll need to test it in the field. So this is where tools like uh, Sensible that I'm gonna talk about and others, um, which do the conversion process for you to make that very smooth. If you have to hand code, um, if you have to hand off your model to an embedded engineer who converts that model into embedded code, that process can take weeks and even worse, your model could end up just not fitting on the device and you have to start that process all over. So this is something we've seen uh, completely derail projects in the past. And assuming you've gotten your model on the device, now it's time to test it in this field. At this point, you need to assess the accuracy and identify which of the previous steps you'll need to iterate over to improve the model's performance. So this process is an iterative one, and we don't typically recommend doing a large data collection in the first iteration. There's always a lot of different things that you have to you figure out um, along the way. So it's better to always stage it with a small number of subjects as part of your initial data collection. And once you have the workflow down, scale up. The worst thing you can do is spend a bunch of time and energy collecting data only to find out there's something wrong with your data collection method. Chris, uh, if I may interrupt uh, for a couple of questions here, I think uh, the previous slide is a very good, uh, a very, very good explanation of the Dynamo uh, workflow. Um, question about number six. Um, in terms of the resource budget on your device, uh, is it uh, recommended to you know, build a model first uh, that performs with, to the highest level of accuracy or the target level of performance, and then look at optimizing it for the resource budget on the device? Or uh, could we also start with um, the model that fits on your device first and see how much you can push the performance? Uh, I think it kind of depends um, on, like uh, a lot of times my process is to use an auto ML type tool first and mm -hmm. see where, where in the ballpark that's gonna be. Um, mm -hmm. Is it way over? my resource budget that I was thinking about, or is it in line with it? So if it's in line with it, then you can just start there trying to go for the highest accuracy. But if it's way over um, sometimes, or if it's not getting high enough accuracy for you at all, sometimes it makes sense to just go and use the most powerful tools to make sure that the problem you're trying to solve can be solved. And then once you know that, then you can work towards actually getting it to fit down on your device. Got it, got it. And uh, the assembling the prototype, uh, is it, uh, you know, depending on the kind of sensor or, or the kind of problem that you're solving, uh, what is your thought on using off-the-shelf devices? For example, if people are doing like a vision problem, you know, just collect a bunch of data on like maybe a cell phone camera and then, um, you know, eventually uh, showing like a proof of concept and then uh, assembling the prototype if you're using a very drastically different type of camera you know you probably need to collect a lot more data on that but how does that how do you uh, envision that uh, depending on on the actual prototype that you're deploying the application on versus a temporary stand-in to do a first iteration of this whole process yeah no i think that's completely fine um, i mean for vision and audio just use the microphones that you have to start 
I think for other applications, like if you're trying to uh, detect different gestures or different motions, um, or you have you haven't, it's kind of more around figuring out which sensors you need to solve your problem. You want to make sure you have the right sensors in place. Got it. All right. Thank you. Please continue. All right. So uh, at Sensimal, we've created a tool to help address some of those major pain points of building a tiny application, uh, mainly around capturing and annotating raw sensor data uh, and generating edge optimized algorithms for classifying that sensor data. So the first tool uh, is the Data Capture Lab, which I'll demo shortly. Um, and that's for capturing and annotating sensor data. The second is the Analytics Studio, which has a rich UI, um, rich web UI for with full auto ML capabilities, along with a Python client that allows you to build out custom pipelines and train your models uh, and tune all of the parameters of that pipeline. And finally, we have the Sensible Knowledge Pack, which is a firmware that's generated for edge devices containing the entire DSP and machine learning pipeline, starting from sensor and raw sensor data input um, all the way through classification. Uh, so here's a little bit more in depth of the data capture lab. So it supports large data sets and multiple users collaborating on multiple projects. Uh, in this example, you can see the time series sensor data for the three accelerometers matching up with the synchronized annotated video of a test subject who's punching. Um, it has a powerful user interface that's optimized towards labeling productivity. So you can quickly annotate key events um, to help you train your model. Once the table has been labeled, we load it into Analytics Studio. Um, and so here's a image of the Analytics Studio where you can build models automatically using AutoML uh, or directed model creation. You can choose among dozens of different optimizations, rapidly repeat the process for different choices and then use the visualizations uh, to see how the various tuning parameters are affecting your model's performance. And once you've built the model, you can download it to the firmware and test it right away. And so the Knowledge Pack firmware is generated using the Sensimal Embedded SDK, uh, which is an edge optimized ML pop pipeline, essentially. And so the pipeline consists of uh, signal pre-processing steps, event triggering steps, um, feature transforms, which uh, extract features from a segment of data, and finally, uh, feeding those features into the classifier um, to get your inference results. And so, uh, yeah. So next, let's go ahead and go to the demo and I'll show you how we build uh, an application using these tools. Quick question. Uh, one of the uh, audience members have asked is, uh, what kind of sensor data does Sensible uh, support? Uh, does it support vision data? Yeah, so we don't have a vision data workflow right now. We mainly focus on time series sensor data. So audio, uh, vibration, uh, anything that you can get off in a sensor uh, that yeah. way. Got it. Thank you. Oops. Yeah. So today I'm going to go through building a tiny, app, tiny ML application uh, using TensorFlow Light Micro and Sensimal and also AutoML. Um, and so you can go on our website and get access to the tools I'm going to use today. If you just go to sensible.com, there's a button up top that says get for free and you can sign up for the community edition. Uh, and for this tutorial, you can check out, um, you can, I have a write up. It's on the uh, TensorFlow blog, um, building a tiny ML application with TF, TF Micro and Sensible. So you can follow along there too, uh, if you're curious. So I'm going to switch over, switch over the tutorial. So I'm going to first open up the data capture lab. So that's the tool right here. Um, and I'm going to open up one of the recent projects, uh, which is boxing punches gesture demo. And so the first thing that happens when you open the data capture lab is it's going to sync up with the cloud project. Um, you can have your project entirely offline, all of the data is stored locally on your computer, um, but you can also upload it and sync it with the cloud so that multiple people can work on the project simultaneously. Um, so when I open up the Project Explorer, it's going to show me the status of my files. It's going to let me know if I have a video associated with that file, the file name, 
And then uh, the, the metadata is over here on the right. So for this project, I'm capturing metadata about which device was used to record, what's the experience level of the person that is doing the gesture, um, which, uh, where's the person, uh, which hand the glove is on, and is this, should I consider this part of my trainer test set? Uh, and so just to give you an example, if you look at the camera, so here's the glove that we put together. Um, and so I took the Nano 33 um, and attached it to the glove just using some tape. And it's got a little battery on it um, to help power it. And so we're gonna use this to detect a number of different uh, boxing gestures. Plug it in real fast. Meanwhile, for the audience members, I do recommend uh, there, there is a slider. If you hover between the screen and, and Chris's uh, video stream coming in, you can actually move the slider to uh, uh, make the camera view larger, or you can make it like 50-50 so you can see both the same size. Yeah, so, okay, so here's the device um, and we attached it to the glove and um, I hooked up a battery to it to power it remotely. So let me go ahead and uh, open up one of these files. So when you open up a file, what you'll see here is the accelerometer data and the gyroscope data in the graph. Um, on the right, here's what we call the segment explorer. So this file has a lot of different gestures in it. Um, we just kind of started collecting data, did a bunch of gestures, and then we're gonna go through and label it after. Um, and so when you label it, all these labels get put here along with information about where's the start of the segment, the length of the segment, uh, and different information. And then you also have a video slider. So as you're doing the different gestures, the video can be synced up with the time series sensor data to really help you label your data really accurately. So, all right, so I'm gonna switch over to capture mode. And Make sure we're connected to the device. Okay. And so I'm using what we call the open gateway to connect to the device over BLE. Um, and the gateway is running on my Raspberry Pi. And then I'm gonna connect to the Raspberry Pi gateway using the data capture lab. So now we can see um, the time series sensor data is streaming from the device right now. Um, and the other thing I wanna do is connect a camera to the data capture lab. So we'll see if this uh, works since I'm using my webcam uh, to record video. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna hit connect here. And so now the data capture lab is going to connect and record camera data <coughs> and sensor data at the same time. Let's get a camera preview. All right. This is using my um, webcam on my laptop now. <laughs> so do the data collection. Uh, we go ahead and select <clears throat> which label we'd like to record. I'm just going to record unknown. I'm going to keep it as my test set. Novice, this is my left glove, and this is a test set. And so you can go through and you can create um, any number of metadata you want, any number of labels that you want. And this really helps you organize your data collection so that uh, if you're collecting data, you're putting in the right metadata. If someone else is collecting data, you know they're adding the right metadata to your files and it helps you keep your project organized. So I'm just gonna come down here and click begin record. 
And so it's gonna start recording uh, the sensor data um, and the video now. I usually do some sort of key at the start, just so. I lost the connection. <laughs> I didn't charge it last night, so it's it just died on me. Um, Okay. Um, yeah, so we'll just start recording. Okay, so we'd start recording the data. Um, I'm wired right now, so I can't really do the full gestures, but you'd come hit the box, uh, hit the boxing glove against the bag, and you're recording your sensor data at the same time as your video, and you click stop recording. And so once you've stopped recording the data, it's stored locally on your hard drive and also synced up to the cloud. So I'd come in and find the file that I just collected and go ahead and open it up. Uh, so I'll just open up one that I collected yesterday. Since I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty with that. Um, so here is a file that I just collected right before we started this. Um, and what you can see here is the video was synced up with the file. And if you play the video, the sensor moves along. And so this helps you figure out what those gestures are. So I'm gonna show you how we label uh, the data now. So how did I put these segments down? You can do segments in two ways. So I can come in and manually label segments uh, on this graph. And so sometimes uh, you might want to do that for audio or continuous events. And another thing you can do is to use an auto segmentation algorithm. So that's what I'm going to do right here. All right, that's what I did here. So if I come in here and I could detect segments, what's going to happen is it's going to use an auto segmenter, which is going to identify events of interest based on um, the different parameters that we've set. And so it comes back and it's actually putting these markers around all of these different events. So I don't have to do anything manually. And the great thing about that is the segmenter that we are using here is also going to be compiled into the firmware. So as the device is um, reading the sensor data, it's being passed through a segmentation algorithm. And it's kind of like a first pass in terms of classification. Uh, so um, and if we come in here and we look at uh, this here, I can see. I can see the markers have been put around the different gestures. And then all I need to do is go ahead and label it. So here at the beginning, um, I was just clapping and it detected those events. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna label those as unknown. Uh, when you're building a gesture application, it's just important to have negative examples as it is to have positive examples. So I just come and label those as unknown. And then I can look here, uh, move the video and see what was I doing at this point in time? And I can see it's just a simple jab. Um, so I know these four are jabs. And then the last one, if we can move the video again and see what I was doing there, it's a hook. And then finally on the last one uh, that it found here, it's just unknown again. So we can use that to build out our data set. Uh, and then we just hit save. Um, and it's going to go ahead and save that. And now when we go to the analytics studio, we'll be able to build a query to pull out whichever data that we want to build a model against. So uh, for this data set, we have five different gestures. I could decide to build a model against three of the gestures, or I could decide to kind combine two gestures like cross and jab into the similar category because they're fairly similar and build a model to detect those four different gestures. Uh, 
So you have a lot of flexibility once you've come and labeled your data. So Data Capture Lab is a great way to build out a really highly curated data set. Um, and once you do that, we'll jump over to the Analytics Studio. So here is the Analytics Studio. Um, if you go to app.sensible.cloud, you can log in. Uh, if you have a community edition project, or you just have to sign up for the community edition, you can get access to it. And so I'll just go ahead and open up the boxing gesture project. Um, and it tells me some information. So I have 34 captured files. I built four queries, a number of pipelines, a number of models. Um, so we'll jump over to the query. So if I open up uh, this query right here, it'll tell me some information about it. So I called this query five gesture and I added a filter to it. So I only wanna pull out data from my train set uh, and I only want it to um, include data from the left glove. And so it tells me how many segments I have uh, for that um, query. So for example, for cross, I have 61 examples or hook 72 examples. And we can do is once you've built your query, you can, uh, use it to set up your model. Um, so. Um, and so when you come in, you select your pipeline and you select, which one is it? Gesture pipeline. Okay, yeah. So here's the one I built yesterday. You select your pipeline, uh, you select which query you want to use as input to the data, and then you can select some different parameters, such as uh, for me, F1 score was the optimization metric. And then this is going to be the maximum classifier size it finds. And then there's a number of advanced settings that you can go into. Uh, and these, can, you can specify different uh, pre-processing steps, different feature extractor families, um, set up your validation method, and then uh, optimize the parameters for the auto ML search. And then you just click optimize and it's gonna go and run through a couple hundred different configurations depending on your settings and come back with the top five models that it finds. And so for this case, uh, we found um, models that had classifier size of 700 bytes, they used 19 features and had pretty good accuracy for this model. So, um, okay. So that's the AutoML approach. Um, the other approach that we have is using the Python client. So a lot of times I'll use Google Colab to build these pipelines. And if you go to the follow this TensorFlow tutorial, it'll point you to this pipeline right here. And so all you need to do is when you come in, you just install, install the Python client for Sensimal. Um, and then you log into the server. So I'm just logging in right here. And now I'm connected uh, to, the, to the cloud project on Sensimal. And so I can set up the project and the pipeline that I want to use, um, look at the different queries. So there's all sorts of APIs to hit all of the cloud endpoints from the, from the uh, Python client. And then I can build a pipeline. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, set my input query, and then I'm going to add a number of different feature group families. So I'm adding statistical, shape, column fusion, area, and rate of change. And each of those has uh, a bunch of... Uh, a number of different feature generators associated with them. And I can specify a feature selection algorithm um, and then trans, uh, scale the data, the features down to one byte before feeding them into the model. And so when you set this up, uh, it creates your pipeline. So that's just a number of steps. You can see here all the feature generators that it's going to create um, based on those that I set. So 213 different features are gonna be generated. And then you just execute the pipeline. And so that executes in the cloud and it returns the feature vector results to you in this uh, Jupyter notebook. Um, and so I'm just looking at the features here so we can look at them visually to see uh, where they fall. 
Um, and then I can take those features and use them to train a model using TensorFlow right here on the notebook. So I'll come here and I just uh, call this, which converts features to, to a tensor, to an input tensor. And then set up my machine learning model using uh, Keras. And then just go ahead and train that model uh, using those features. And so right here, you can see it's just training in the cloud, prints out the accuracy for the validation and the test set. Um, and then once you've trained that model, you can quantize it if you want to, or uh, use the full model. What's important is that you convert it to a TensorFlow Lite flat buffer. Um, in this case, there's not really a huge difference between the quantized model and the full model size. And that's just because I'm not using any convolution layers. It's uh, just a dense neural network. Um, and once you've done that, you just load that model back up as part of your pipeline. So I call DSK pipeline set training algorithm load model TF micro, and that's going to upload the model back to the final stage of my pipeline. Um, and then these are just looking at the result, the validation for that um, pipeline. And then all I need to do is say model.knowledgepack save, and it's going to save that entire training pipeline, and I can download it as firmware for the Nano 33. Um, and when it generates the knowledge pack, uh, it's going to take the model that you've created, pull out only the ops that are necessary, uh, and compile it um, using CMSYS optimized uh, with the TensorFlow Lite micro inference engine. So once we've done that, um, you've either trained the model locally using the Python client, or you've trained it using AutoML. You can come into the Explore Model tab. And here you can look at a little bit more information about the model. So for this one, I can look and see what are the different features that it selected um, and how good of a class separation that they did. So here's a 2D plot of those features. You can look at the confusion matrix, which is telling you the average across all of your validation sets. And you can look in more detail about the feature summary to see which feature was selected, um, which sensors are being fed into it, and what are the parameters for that feature generator. And this graph is a really good way to look and see, do you have good class separation with your model? Um, and so for each feature, it's just plotting all, all of the values with respect to each class. And so what I always look for is just um, features that have good separation. For example, here's the uppercut, and it's well separated from the other classes. So when I see that, I know that probably we're selecting good features, and uh, we'll be able to build a good model for that. Um, you can look at the model summary, which tells you information about the classifier and the training algorithm. Um, the pipeline summary, this, is, this tells us basically steps that were used to train the model in the cloud. And the knowledge pack summary, which tells us all the steps that are going to be used uh, flash to the device when we're actually performing inference. Then we can jump over to the test model screen. So for this one, uh, I want to pull out all the, train, all the test data for my left glove. Oops, left glove. Um, and I just want to run, uh, compute the accuracy for all of those um, labeled values. So I can just come in here and say compute accuracy, and that's going to compile the firmware uh, and run it in emulation in the cloud and return the results. So I know here the results I'm seeing are going to match with what I would have seen on the device if I was actually running it there at this point. So just wait a second. Okay. Yeah, so we come back and uh, we can look at here and see what the accuracy looks like for our test data set. So I think these are um, the unknown ones were the ones I just collected. And so you can come in and see where is the model performing correctly? Where is it identifying things wrong? Um, so I can see the confusion matrix across all of the files that we have is pretty good. So uh, in general, the model is getting uh, doing a pretty good job across all the data sets, but we're seeing some confusion between uh, cross and jab because they look pretty similar. And then if I click on one of these in particular, so here's uh, gesture overhand, I can see where all of the predictions occurred um, as the solid lines and then the uh, other line is the actual ground truth label. And this is just telling me that between these two, there was a a difference between what I labeled as a ground truth and what actually the model predicted. 
So finally, once you're happy with your model, you can come to the download model screen. And so we support a number of different platforms. Uh, so if you have um, ARM, an ARM processor, you can download a model that's compiled for uh, ARM M4, M7, or A53, uh, and you can specify which compiler you want to use. Uh, for some platforms that we have fully supported into the um, into our toolkit, such as the Quick Feather, you can actually download binaries. And so that's going to compile in uh, all the sensor drivers, an entire application, and you can just directly flash that to the device. You don't have to make any modifications. So for the Arduino, uh, for the Nano 33, we're going to download for the Arduino ARM processor, uh, set our float options to soft FP, um, and then go ahead and click download. And so this is going to come in. It's going to compile the model for the Nano 33 and return a library to us. And so I've already downloaded one uh, earlier. And so if you go to our GitHub, um, you can get access to the, you can see the Nano, you'll see the Nano 33 Knowledge Pack repo. And all you'll need to do is take the library files that gets downloaded and copy those over here and come over to the, you need to install platform IO. If you're using a TensorFlow model, just you come here and click build with TensorFlow using Nano 33. Um, with, if you're using just a regular model that doesn't use TensorFlow, you can just come here and click build. And this will uh, compile the knowledge pack and flash it to the device and it'll be ready to um, start recognizing gestures. So I'll just go ahead and build this and upload it to the device. And then jump over to the gateway. And so uh, we're going to use the gateway to validate our results. So if I click um, recognition mode, connection type VLE, and I put in the device ID and hit connect. Let's try one more time. Okay, so here's the gateway running. So it's uh, connected to the device here, and this is just the UI. So I can switch over to test mode um, and click start stream. And it's gonna, so I just did some random gesture. And it came up with unknown because it doesn't know it. But then if we come over to the boxing bag and we do the different gestures that we train the model on, you can see that it's picking up those different gestures really fast um, in real time. So. so the test mode here is just reading the BLE characteristic off the device and letting us know. And that BLE characteristic is telling us what gesture just occurred. You'll notice that it's not continuously sending out classifications because it has that segmentation algorithm uh, running on the device. Um, it really helps us limit the number of classifications that we need to perform because we're only looking at events that are interesting that we need to de detect. Uh, and it also helps us capture the start and the end of the event, which is uh, really helps us improve the model accuracy. So we're saving battery and improving the accuracy by using the segmentation. Um, so that is the end of the demo. Um, and then here's just, uh, so since we've been working really hard to develop uh, ecosystem partners um, and different platforms that we support. And so here's a list of some of our ecosystem partners, as well as a lot of the platforms that we're supporting right now. Um, and I also want to mention our Sensible Open Source Initiative. So this, this is something that I'm really excited about, and I think it's going to be great for the community too. 
uh, help address those key AI pain points around collecting sensor data, understanding what's actually going on inside of the machine learning models that we're generating um, and managing and tuning the AutoML code. So we have uh, four applications that we've, or some applications that we've created. So the uh, test app for looking at BLE characteristics. Um, there's an Android version that is really great for uh, setting up a demo, uh, validating your models working. We are going to release our, our embedded SDK as an open source project uh, this summer um, so that all of the code that you see here that's running on the device, you'll be able to modify, uh, improve for your specific application. Um, we have a data set of an open data set where we are constantly putting new data sets that we collect, um, that some that we collected back in the Intel days. Uh, such as our running, co uh, running coach. Um, there's dogs where we went out and collected sensor data on over 75 different dogs from things like eating, drinking, barking, um, running and walking. Uh, and then we have the open gateway, which is uh, the tool I just so showed that can run Mac, um, Linux, or Windows and can connect, uh, collect data over BLE, um, TCP IP, or serial ports. Um, and it's easily extensible. So if you want to add some other sensor type, uh, you can do that. And then the open data interface is just uh, specs for collecting um, sensor data and running machine learning models using either MQTT SN serial uh, or what we call the simple streaming interface. So you can go and check out our blog article on the open source initiative and what we're trying to achieve there. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank you for attending. Um, you can contact me at chris.narowski at sensimal.com uh, or reach us as a company at httpssensimal.com slash contact. And again, uh, please go sign up for the community edition uh, and create an account. It's completely free and try it out and let us know uh, how it goes. So uh, thanks for having me. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. Very impressive demo and really great to hear about the uh, open source initiative. All really very, uh, I can really feel, you know, those pain points myself. I totally agree. There's really good points to focus on. By the way, we have a ton of questions. I didn't want to interrupt you during the demo. Uh, so uh, let's, let's get to them. So uh, one of the questions uh, that was asked is about if you wanted to update the ML model, do we need to repeat everything from scratch, retrain? Uh, convert to TensorFlow Lite, upload, or is there a way to bypass the process? So if you want to update the model, uh, mm -hmm. if so if you have, you know, I guess, update I guess you the don't model. Need to uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, somebody had answered it in the, in the Q&A also uh, about, uh, you know, whether, you don't. You probably don't need to collect new data, but if you are retraining a model for another, for a new model architecture or new accuracy uh, numbers, I guess you do need to a like train it uh, and then go through the rest of the process that you talked about. But the data annotation yeah, is once and done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have if your data works um, for your project and you're able to get good results, then you don't need to go back to that step. Um, but you might come and find out that. Uh, you need some more. So for example, in this one, maybe I need some more examples between jab and cross. Um, so I need to go back and collect that data. Or uh, you might, when you go and collect data across a number of subjects, you might see different things there. So you might focus on a particular subset of those. So as long as you're capturing the metadata, um, then that's going to help you figure out which data you actually need to collect again. Got it. Uh, in, in the example that you showed, what is the latency of the computation? Uh, uh, that happens as soon as you perform a gesture, or is the uh, you know the the, the pre-processing you know segmentation auto segmentation that you have uh, the actual uh, the the neural network that does the classification and then uh, to transmit that result. What would you say is the total latency with that? Um, it it's a millisecond. So you saw me doing the demo live. So I mean that's yep. going from the device. Uh, it's doing the computation and sending out the BLE update, which I'm um, re reading and showing. So it's it's really fast. It just depends on, I mean, it's always going to depend on how many feature extractors you have in your pipeline, and then what's the size of the class complexity of the classifier. So the more you have there, the more it's going to extend out um, the computation. There's different things that you can do. So for example, uh, 
to increase that speed. For example, with audio, a lot of times what we do is we use what we call feature cascade um, or where you have a number of feature banks. And as the audio data is coming in, you're constantly computing MFC coefficients. And so that mm -hmm. by the time you get enough, you can just send all of those coefficients to your classifier. Um, so you can do, do things a number of different ways depending on the application. Got it. And, and there are some other questions uh, which I think Bruce from your team is already answering in the Q&A, so I'll skip those. Uh, does Sensible support ESP32 board? Um, that's one of the platforms that we're looking to add right now. Uh, we okay. have to add, update the compiler, but it's one of the things that's on our roadmap to do. Got it. Um, can I import MySQL time series sensor data, for example, temperature, humidity, pressure, et cetera? Somebody said here uh, they already have uh, hundreds of megabytes in MySQL database. Uh, so rather than collecting new data through your platform, can you import data from other uh, um, data sets? Yeah. So the Data Capture Lab is our, our main import tool. And you can import data through CSV files um, or through WAV files. And we also have a programmatic um, interface for importing data. So that's what we, it's called a DCLI format. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times it's just a matter of looking at your data and doing the conversion um, using the DCLI format and then just importing that. So I've, I've gone through a number of just public data sets and been able to convert them easily. Um, one of the ones that we did is the uh, wake word, um, the Google speech wake word one. So we've converted that to a DCL project and imported that, no problem. Great, great. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, somebody has asked about uh, is, is there any way Sensimil can help for synthetic data generation? And, and along those lines, I'd also ask about what kind of data augmentation uh, do you provide in, in your platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a couple of different data augment augmentation strategies. A lot of times, um, so for video, it makes sense to do data augmentation. Uh, so our uh, image data, make, data augmentation makes a lot of sense. Audio, it makes a lot of sense too. Um, to some extent, people will do, you can do feature masks, um, time masks, and then different controlling the pitch and adding in different background noise. Uh, but when you start to get into other types of sensor data, like vibration data, um, the augmentation isn't quite as useful because a lot of times you're actually changing the signature too much if you're not doing it in a really careful way. So we haven't, you can like adding some small noise, um, we've seen help a little bit, but it hasn't uh, necessarily been, like there's not a lot of manipulations you can do where you're not completely changing the signature of the data. So you have to be careful there. Um, so we do have some augmentation strategies built into the pipeline workflow that you can select if you're building a pipeline. Right, that makes sense. And uh, for, I, I guess, for example, in uh, images, uh, symmetric objects, like let's say faces, people do left, right flipping, but I doubt that if you're doing a job with your right arm and left arm, I don't think that's straightforward to just- Yeah, it's not quite as straightforward. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, oh, another question uh, is about uh, calibration of the sensors. Do you, do, do you have to do any specific calibration of the sensors or uh, no? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when you get a sensor from the factory, um, they have some pre um, some inbuilt calibrations. Mm -hmm. um, so you just got to make sure that you're following all of those uh, basic things, um, kind of like the standard procedures to calibrate your sensors. We're not really working on that as part of our pipeline. We kind of expect you to have done that homework beforehand. Got it, got it. Um, yeah, uh, Chris and Bruce from your team have answered a lot of questions, so that saves us a lot okay. of time. Uh, one question is about what type of battery have you used for the Nano 33 BLE in your demo, and how long does it last? Yeah, so I have uh, just this really tiny 3.7 volt, 105 uh, milliamp um, battery on here, and it'll last for a while. Um, I think the... I have some issues with this little battery pack that I'm using to charge it, um, which is why I think I was losing the signal. But yeah, it'll it'll last for a while. I haven't really timed it, <laughs> but this it's also not optimized to run for a long time. It's just a standard firmware right now. 
makes sense. Uh, does Sensible have a function that considers estimated power usage in the suggested models, or is that something that you're planning to introduce? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're working on uh, bringing the tools that we use to estimate power into our UI um, uh, framework so that it's more visible to our users. Um, but yeah, so we estimate a lot of times the power consumption is basically coming from how many features you have and what's the complexity of the classifier that you're using. Um, and so you can use that as a proxy to, to get a feel for whether one model is using more power than another. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the other way around it is, or the other thing that you have to take into account is, um, can you just batch sensor data and do the processing? Um, so a lot of a lot of the times that if you're a lot of times the classifiers, you know, not running that long, and most of your power saving is just around managing the state of the device. Right, makes sense. Yeah. Um, another question is about. Uh, uh, limitations of the segmentation algorithm, the auto segmentation that you talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you reveal some details about how it works or is that a proprietary thing? Yeah, so we have a number of different auto segmentation or a number of different auto segmentation algorithms. And the way they work is typically we've looked at some general classes of problems that we come across. Mm -hmm. um, and we've just parameterized like, how did we solve this particular one? Can we parameterize it so that other people can put in uh, the parameter, the tuning parameters for this algorithm and make it work for the use case. So we have a number of ones built into the platform. Um, we have uh, a mode where you can go through and just put manual labels around your segments and then click search for segmentation algorithm. And it'll try and find an algorithm or the parameters that do the best segmentation for that data set. Um, and so those, those are... Uh, we have ours built in and obviously, you know, with time series sensor data, I feel like the biggest challenge a lot of times is finding a good segmentation algorithm, depending on the problem. Um, and so you can also build your own and use that as part of the pipeline. And so we're working on making that a little bit easier right now. It's part of our roadmap for users to add their own custom segmentation algorithms. Great, yeah, that, that leads into the next question, whether this platform supports custom models or custom pre-processing steps, if people mm -hmm. do want to write their own code. Yeah, that's definitely something we're working on right now. Um, we want, we have, for us, it's a great platform. Uh, we found, and our customers really like it, but one of the things, one of the challenges is with any, you know, SaaS service is you can always hit a wall where you're like, man, if I could just get it to do this, um, <laughs> like I know that this feature would be great and improve my accuracy. Uh, so we, for us, uh, that's one of the things that we're working on right now is making it possible for users to upload their own functions um, that, are op that are written in C and optimized for their devices and compile that as part of just the AutoML process and the model building process and then download that to the firmware. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're working on right now. Got it. Uh... One other question, uh, are there any extra device uh, specific drivers for the device that you are uh, installing to? Uh, do you need to install the drivers on your PC or does uh, Sensimal kind of installation kind of take care of everything? The drivers for? Uh, for the embedded device. Uh, to, yeah, it kind of depends. It depends on your device. So the Nano 33, um, Sensimal provides the library for it. And then we have a GitHub repo that has the firmware that you um, compile the library into. And so the library, all it is, is it takes in sensor data and it returns a classification. So you can almost use it as a black bot, like a plug and play into your application. Um, and then for the Nano 33, if you download Visual Studio Code, install the platform IO extension, uh, you can just hit build and it'll install everything that you need for you. It'll get everything set up for you. And it just is going to depend. Each firmware board is different depending on how they have their SDK set up. Uh, one we have time for one last question. Uh, thank you again to your team for answering a lot of questions. Uh, you know, what, final question uh, is kind of a challenging one, but uh, what is the difference between Sensimal and Edge Impulse? Yeah, I think um, there's definitely a lot of similarities and a lot of differences that come across. I haven't used Edge Impulse too. I think one of the main differences there is they are focusing, they've focused a lot of energy on, um, it seems like video data too. 
Um, and they also, uh, whereas we are focused very heavily on time series sensor data um, and that labeling process to make sure that, you know, the data that you're feeding into your model is as accurate as possible. Um, and then uh, another focus is on the AutoML tools. For us, the AutoML tools to make sure that you can get up and running quickly. And then once you've done that, you can delve into all of the minute details of the pipelines um, using the Python client to tune those parameters. So. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. It is a very exciting uh, presentation, uh, really nice demo. And thank you for answering uh, all these questions. We, we may have a few more. Uh, you know, we'll, let's uh, follow up on forums.dynamo.org. Uh, you know, please, please go uh, ask your questions there. And Chris and his team, if you can take a look at it uh, later today uh, when all the questions are up, that'd be really great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, uh, thank you. We would like to thank our TinyML Talk sponsors again, Arm and Qualcomm, our TinyML strategic partners. Arm, architecting a smarter world, uh, powering innovation through AI. Arm, the software and hardware foundation for TinyML. Qualcomm, Qualcomm AI research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. DeepLight, DeepLight uses AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Edge Impulse enables developers to create the next generation of intelligent device solutions with embedded machine learning. Maxim Integrated, enabling edge intelligence with sensors and signal conditioning, low power microcontrollers, and advanced AI acceleration. The new Max 78000 implements AI inferences at low energy levels. Now the edge can see and hear like never before. Kixo AutoML, automated machine learning platform that builds TinyML solutions for the edge using sensor data. Reality AI, Reality AI is the leading product development environment for edge AI TinyML on MCUs. And finally, Synsense. Synsense builds ultra low power sensing and inference hardware for embedded mobile and edge devices. Just a reminder of our next TinyML talks by Karthik Thakur in two weeks. Thank you everyone for joining us and see you next time.